So the first one uh, that I wanted to introduce is uh, Diane Tagvorian, um, and uh, she is the executive director of the Environmental Health Coalition right here in San Diego. And um, it is largely because of, of their work, EHC's work, uh, that I have thought about uh, how to tell uh, the EJ story in California uh, being in three phases. Uh, first, um, working uh, at the community level, building community capacity and building community-driven models, and then um, uh, building political power and uh, uh, influencing the legislative process. And then lastly, uh, thirdly, uh, implementation of cutting edge programs. Um, and Diane has been intimately involved in all three phases. So we are truly uh, fortunate to have her kick off uh, this event today. Thank you, Charles. I'm honored to be here, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I guess I'm your official welcomer to San Diego, so I'm so glad that you're all here and to know that so many of you are uh, from outside of California. Uh, and I also want to say that there are many, many environmental justice heroes in this room. So um, my hat goes off to all of you, and I am appreciative of all of you and for the hard work that you've all done uh, for these many decades, including Charles, who uh, actually kicked off, if you don't know, by writing the Toxic Waste and Race Report in 1985, six, sorry, uh, and well, I was close. Um, I was in the right decade and it really uh, launched a movement. I really appreciate the work of the committee um, to help us to be here tonight. And I don't wanna start on a negative note, but I'm going to have to bring some reality to our convening today uh, before I start on my prepared comments. And I want to tell you this because I feel like everyone needs to know that you, uh, all of us that are in the environmental justice movement have to be warriors. We are survivors in many ways. And on Saturday morning at 12.30 a.m., uh, one of our allies' offices was uh, torched, uh, was firebombed, actually. And their T-shirts were uh, brought out on the lawn and burned. Their office was destroyed. And this is ACE, which is a statewide organization, and we have a very powerful uh, ally, in a partner in, in San Diego and Chula Vista. So I want you to know that we are in this struggle, but this is not without risk. This is not without risk of physical and human uh, abuse and attack. And tomorrow morning, we're having a press conference with all the progressive environmental and social justice organizations in San Diego. And I, I'm, I don't mean to start negatively, but I think we need to get grounded in the reality that we're living in today and how important this work is for all of us. So I think they and we all appreciate your thoughts. And, uh, and good wishes for them and your, your work in the struggle continuing on. So I wanna say that, um, I'm gonna use this. And to say that, of course we all know what environmental justice is. And I wanna say that while they're not here in the room today, our community uh, allies and our community leaders are with us today in this room, as well as the environmental justice heroes. And I think my job, as Charles said, is to really talk about what it takes to do environmental justice work, not only here in California, but throughout the country and actually throughout the world. And as I always kind of say, environmental justice uh, folks have to do it all, from local organizing to, I didn't do that, from local organizing to the, their own community-based research, to policy advocacy, to state policy. And that's the trajectory that I wanna take you on today because it's important for you to know that community solutions are the ones that often work very well at the local, state, and national level. And environmental justice groups are really behind a lot of the work that's happening across the country and it all starts on the ground. And it certainly all starts with our goal for healthy neighborhoods. And our children are most at risk. And that's true throughout the country in every environmental justice community. This map of San Diego, which shows you where the highest asthma rates are, 
which is in low-income communities of color, could be anywhere in an environmental justice community across the country. We all have this map to show you. High cancer rates, high asthma rates, high respiratory disease rates. And it's something that we share uh, and something that we're fighting against. The other thing that I think we often share is in our communities, we have what we call incompatible land uses or discriminatory zoning, which allows homes and schools to be right next to um, factories that are polluting, next to ports that have lots of air pollution coming from them. There are uh, explos explosion risks uh, that occur in these neighborhoods. Here in National City with the plume that's on your right, uh, this is a fire that occurred on a Sunday morning right in a residential neighborhood because this auto body shop was located right in the residential neighborhood. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but the auto body shop exploded um, on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we're looking at communities where we have a high degree of diesel trucks that are coming in and out as a result of port activity or other kind of goods movement activity. Again, incompatible land uses, accidents. Uh, the, the one picture with the ship is, uh, is a real picture <laughs> with uh, the ship that's unloading cars at the port of San Diego at the National City Terminal right next to a park. And that's where our children have to play. So we all know that these are signs of environmental racism and that these are situations that need to be repaired. Here we look at uh, land use in West National City where you see all the red areas are industrial, yellow are um, residential and commercial, and these are areas that are mixed. And these are the, one of the um, things that we have worked on very hard to begin to, sh to change. We think, again, it starts at the community level, that community members, as they say, are on the front lines of the impact, but we're also on the front lines of the solution. And these two women, being very active in National City, helped to create the West Side Specific Plan, which was adopted in 2010, that actually separated uh, in zoning uh, polluting uses and homes and schools. And it also did something else. It adopted, uh, the city council adopted what we called an amortization ordinance, which actually gives the city the power to relocate or phase out uh, polluting uses like auto body shops and plating shops that are located right next to homes and schools because they became non-conforming uses. So these are successes that we were able to achieve on the ground. And so Environmental Health Coalition was able to then share that information through a community training program um, about community planning and also through a video. And then as a result of that, we were able to pass one of the first environmental justice elements in the state of California in National City in 2011. As a result of that, the California Environmental Justice Alliance was able to get a, a green zones measure passed, which actually allowed uh, SB 1000 to be passed in 2016, which requires that all cities in the state of California uh, institute an environmental justice element. So going from local organizing to regional policy to state policy was really the goal and something that we are, we're very proud of and excited that we were able to bring the Green Zones uh, picture to all cities in the state of California. And then from Green Zones, we were able to work with the state of California and with our allies across the, across the state in environmental justice communities to go to transformative climate communities, which actually identifies those communities, again, they're green zones, environmental justice communities, whatever you want to call them, they are the communities that have the most impacts as a result of polluting industries and from greenhouse gases. And we were able to um, get AB 2722 uh, passed, which actually allocates millions of dollars to those communities for investments that can begin to reduce greenhouse gases as well as to improve infrastructure and invest in communities. One of the ways that that occurred in, in uh, National City here in San Diego was $9 million from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund was able to be put into the Paradise Creek apartments. So you see on the bottom here, uh, the Paradise Creek, which runs through 
uh, excuse me, West National City, and there used to be a bus depot and um, an operations yard for the city of National City that was quite polluting. But we envisioned that there could be 200 affordable housing units, and that came to pass when the GGRF funds actually were able to plug the last $9 million gap of this uh, $50 million uh, project so that 200 families now have homes. They're all very affordable and it's all national city residents as a result of a policy we were able to get passed. So that's the kind of thing that can happen on the ground when we have environmental justice communities that are in, empowered and trained and also working with community uh, organ housing organizations. Uh, one of the other things that we were able to do uh, was to get AB 1288 passed in 2015. And as a result of this introduction of this bill and adoption of this bill by uh, then um, Speaker Tony Atkins of the State Assembly, we were able to get two members of the environmental justice communities uh, appointed to the California Air Resources Board. And I was privileged to be one of those people. So I am currently serving on the Air Resources Board, and that's something that we think is very important, that environmental justice voices are actually on the boards that are making these decisions about regulations in, in California and throughout the state. So I'm going to stop there and uh, at, take your questions about anything I've shared with you, and then I'm just gonna say a few words about Cal Enviro Screen uh, before Arsenio is, uh, comes up. And I'd just like to say that um, we have three mics placed here, so we'd appreciate it if you jump up and run over to one of the mics so that everyone can hear you. Otherwise, we'll have to be repeating questions. Um, I'd also like to say that, as you probably noticed, we started the program a little bit late because it took people a while to find this place. And so <clears throat> the food is already here, though. So um, I think it would be if you want to wander over and have some food while you're listening, I think that's okay. Because okay, it's, you know, we're going to run a little over, too. We're probably done at 8.15. Okay, so who has a question or a comment? I just want to hear, hear a little bit more from what she has to say. That might be okay, too. I can't see you at all, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's light. It's very go. bright. One over here. Hi, Diana. I'm Shayla Serpis, hey, uh, Shayla. family doctor here in San Diego. I just want to thank you. That was so articulate and so rapid, and I appreciate that maybe people are from out of the area and not too familiar with the region. So um, I think working together with the medical community and um, showing those same maps and how um, chronic disease and other things besides asthma, like childhood obesity. Um, so I just want to say that the Environmental Health Coalition has done an outstanding job in um, also working with the medical community and the school districts to improve the wellness of the entire community. And I just want to thank you for being so articulate and laying that out so clearly. Thank you, Shayla. Dr. Sherpas is one of our heroes, um, environmental justice heroes here in uh, San Diego and in the South Bay. She uh, works every day to repair the damage that's been done um, to our kids and to our families as a result of this pollution. So thank you, Shayla. Appreciate it. In Philadelphia. Uh, you mentioned something about amortization as a method for getting rid of polluters in, it, in the community, and I don't know how that works. Could you explain that? I, I can. Um, I, Went right by it. Let me get there. So we were able to get an ordinance passed, which actually gives power to the city council to what they would, what we would call amortize a non-conforming use. So in the west side of National City, we got a new community plan adopted, which changed the zoning. So rather than having what was then mixed use, which was industrial, residential, and commercial, it changed to residential and commercial. So there were still industrial uses there. They then became non-conforming uses. And we were able to, with the help of actually EPA, uh, US EPA, we were able to get uh, resources for the city of National City to create a ranking program uh, they ranked more than 100 of the polluting uses in this small west side of National City as to which ones were the most uh, risky for the community's health. And then the city started at the top of the list to say, 
those uh, businesses would be valued in terms of what their value was and how long they would have to actually be phased out of the community. So two of those businesses have actually been phased out and uh, they're hoping to take action on the next five uh, in 2019. I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to ask you to go back to your presentation now okay. and move on. And we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end of this panel. Okay. So one of the most uh, stunning things I think that well, we were, we've been able to do in California, and I know a lot of you are, are very aware of this, is the adoption of Cal the Cal Enviro screen. And Arsenio Mataka is going to come up in just a minute and talk to you about um, really the the history of that and how important that is to, to our communities. But I wanted to kind of take you back to pre-Arsenio, well, not pre-Arsenio's life, but uh, <laughs> pre-Arsenio in state government, uh, when the first environmental justice laws were passed in the state of California in the late 1990s and environmental justice was defined. There was also the establishment of the Cal EPA Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, and I had the privilege of uh, co-chairing that committee. And one of the things that came out of uh, that committee with 150 recommendations was that we define cumulative impacts to be what you're seeing on the screen, and we also said that cumulative impacts should not only be identified, but that we should identify those communities that are most at risk and we should begin to prioritize our programs, our regulations, and our investments towards those communities. And we, had, we, we started to think about that uh, long before 2004, just like all the rest of you have thought about the fact that the communities that are most impacted by pollution are also impacted by um, other health outcomes, uh, uh, low education, we have low voting, we have linguistic isolation, we've got um, substandard housing, we've got kids that are growing up in unhealthy environment, lack of green space, you know what the list is. So we knew that we knew what those communities are, but we didn't have a more scientific and health-based way of identifying them. So as the state was kind of gearing up to begin to do that, uh, there's a team that you see here on the screen from uh, Rachel Morella Frosch and Manuel Pastor, right there. Thank you, Manuel, um, who came together to develop the environment, environmental justice screening method. And then, because they are the um, academics uh, who care about the community and want to involve the community, Environmental Health Coalition and other environmental justice groups across the state were involved with them and we actually did what we called ground truthing. So they collected the data that they could get their hands on and we took it out into the communities and said, is that right? Um, is that factory actually there? Is there a school there? Is there a house there? And then that data was able to be, um, to be changed and, uh, and fixed. And I don't think anyone thought it was perfect, but it was pretty close. Um, and it really reflected what we live on the ground every day. And so this was the first map uh, that we were able to identify. And Joy Williams, our uh, research director, is here. And this is her map uh, that she was able to develop from that first data. And then Cal Enviro Screen began to be developed. And this is uh, the beginning of Cal Enviro Screen. And this is where I step off and Arsenio steps on because this was the beginning of what we saw as, the, as what Cal Enviro Screen would be comprised of as we began to see that for the entire state of California. 